Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. On King, on your huskies. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. Back to the days of the gold rush. And the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon in their relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. The Quaker Oats Company, makers of Quaker Pops Wheat and Quaker Pops Rice, the delicious cereals shot from guns, and the Mutual Broadcasting System, present by special recording, Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. Our adventure will begin in just a moment. Safe drivers seldom have emergencies, but they can happen. And how you handle yourself and your car during an emergency may be a matter of life and death. For example, what should you do if your car catches on fire? The National Safety Council says the first thing to do is turn off the ignition. Next, get everybody out of the car. And if possible, call the fire department. Use a fire extinguisher if you have one, or smother the fire with whatever is available. Water, sand, dirt, or a blanket. Be sure the fire is out before you start the engine again. Better yet, don't let a fire start. Be careful with your cigarettes. Avoid excessive use of the brakes going downhill. And have the electric and fueling systems checked regularly. Fires are costly and dangerous. This message is brought to you as a public service. A trapper named Sam Baker had entered a cabin several miles from the town of Big Elk and had stumbled over an old carpet, disclosing a trapdoor in the floor. It must be a cellar beneath the shack. Baker lifted the trap door and saw narrow wooden stairs leading into the gloom below. It's too dark to see anything down there. I need a light. He found a wax-spattered bottle that held a gutted candle. He lit the candle, then descended the stairs. Hey, it is a cellar. A big one, too. Holding the candle steady, Baker walked to the center of the underground room. There he stopped and stared wide-eyed. All these smokes. Look at those pelts. I'll bet every one of them is stolen. He placed the bottle-held candle on the floor, and then began to go through the pelts. He examined each one carefully, until he found a skin that bore a familiar mark. Uh, this one's mine. So is this. And this... Baker counted the marked pelts. Then he picked up the candle and mounted the stairs. I'll get out of here and go back to town. Reach, mister. Walk up the rest of those stairs slowly. You gonna reach or do we blow the top of your head off? I reckon there's no use arguing with two guns. Yeah, that's better. What were you looking for in the cellar? I found the furs you stole from me. Furs we stole? Yes, you. I recognize you, too. Even though your faces were covered when you robbed me. How do you know the pelts are yours? Because I marked them. Maybe you made a mistake. No, there's no mistake. I no more mark them a pelts. I was only stunned when you talked. On he had lowered his right hand so slowly that neither of the two men facing him realized his plan until he made a sudden grab for his gun. No, I got Blaze. You asked for it, Baker. Oh. You got him, Blaze. Yeah, he almost got me. If his bullet's been any closer, I'd have a hole in my head. Well, he's dead, the dirty snooper. What'll we do with the body? I'll hide it in the cellar while you go to Big Elk and report to the boss. It was nearly four hours later when the outlaw called Blaze reached the outskirts of the town of Big Elk. His destination was a small log building, and as he approached it, he was surprised to see John Derby unlocking the door. Before John Derby could close the door, Blaze called... Mr. Derby? Yes? Blaze, what are you doing here? Uh, I got to talk to you. Get into the office. They close the door, Blaze, while I take off my park and double the fire. You've been out of town? Yeah, Pete Burwell and I investigated some mining property in the hills. Well, he, who's Pete Burwell? <laughs> I know this gambler. He owns 
a cafe here in town, a number of claims in the hills. Now, Blaze, what's on your mind? As briefly as possible, Blaze told what had happened in the cabin. As he talked, he tried to ignore the grim disapproval in John Derby's face. He went for his gun, I let him have it. Maybe it's just as well I did, because if he'd have lived, he'd have gone to the law. The law will be in town tonight. The body's due to hit here on patrol. I didn't know that. You know it now. Maybe Cork and I should clear out with the first. No, you can't. The buyer's due from the States next week. I'll sell all the pelts to him. What about the money? There'll be an investigation as soon as he learns of the murder. We could shove Baker's body under the ice. It'll drift down. That'd be fine if Baker were a friendless drifter. The one would miss him. But Baker and Pete Burwell were good friends. Does Burwell know Baker went to the cabin? If he does, he'll tell the Marty. Maybe I should take care of Burwell. From now on, you'll do nothing without orders from me, you understand? But what about Pete Burwell? Well, maybe... Maybe I'll be able to convince the Marty that Pete killed Sam Baker. How are you work that? Pete and I were alone this afternoon. The one saw us leave town. What about it? Without me to back his word... People have no alibi. Hey. Hey, I savvy. What do you want me to do? I uh, have a letter from Joe Morris, a trapper in White Pine. Morris has heard of the fur robberies around here, and he figures that by traveling at night, he'll escape the thieves. <laughs> he expects to arrive in Elk City tomorrow morning. Is he bringing his pelts with him? Yes. He says he has some of the finest ermine he's ever trapped. And he knows I'll pay top price for it. Too bad we won't be able to get it for nothing. We are going to get it for nothing. With a money in Elk City? Why not? But Mr. Derby, it'll be downright risky. Not if you use your heads. Make sure Morris hears you say you're heading for White Pine or someplace even farther north. When Morris tells the mobby, he'll start north to track you down. All right, if you say so. But I think we should leave well enough alone. You leave the thinking to me. I see that you're waiting on the trail tonight to stop Morris. All right, we'll be there. What about Baker's body? Shove it under the ice? No. Leave it in the cellar for the time being. We'll dispose of it after our plan is worked out. Now get going, Blaze. You have a lot to do. As Blaze started the return trip to the cabin in the hills, he left the prosperous fur trader he called Boss sitting before the fire in his small office. John Derby was plotting a story to frame Pete Burwell. Satisfied with his scheme, he left the office and went out to look for the Mountie who was expected that evening. When he learned that Sergeant Preston was at Pete Burwell's casino, John Derby hurried to reach the policeman before Pete Burwell had an opportunity to talk. Oh, is Sergeant Preston here? Yes, looking over the gambling tables. His dog's with him. Oh, yes, I see him. Oh, Ed, where's Pete Burwell? He's been out a little while ago, Mr. Derby. Didn't say where he's going. You want to see Pete? No, no, I want to see Sergeant Preston. Uh, Sergeant Preston? Yes? I'm uh, John Derby. Oh, I'm glad to know you. I've, uh, I've got to talk to you, Sergeant, but I'd like to talk privately. Very well, Derby. Suppose we go over to that corner table there. Right. Nobody over here is there. Now, what's on your mind? Murder. Whose murder? A trapper named Sam Baker. He was shot and killed early this afternoon. Where? In the hills beyond town. You see, Sergeant, about three weeks ago, Baker was robbed of some mighty valuable pelts. I've heard of the fur robberies in this area. Nearly a dozen trappers have lost pelts. Naturally, I'm concerned. The robberies discourage trappers, and my business depends on the purchase of skins. I see. After the robbery, Baker rented a room behind the cafe from Pete Burwell. I thought he and Burwell were good friends. Now, I am no different. What do you mean? This morning, Pete Burwell and Sam Baker left town together. This evening, a trapper named Blaze came to my office. He saw Burwell and Baker in the hills this afternoon. Blaze said they were arguing. Pete pulled a gun and killed Baker. Where's Blaze? He probably went back to his cabin. Huh? I'll, uh, I'll send a man there at once and ask him to come into town. He'll tell you the story himself. Is Pete Burwell here? No, he uh, left town shortly before you walked in, Sergeant Preston. You know where he was going? But he didn't say. I think he went to hide Baker's body. He'll figure he's safe. 
He doesn't know there was a witness to the murder. Thanks for the information. So what are you going to do, sir? Find Pete Burwell. I'll be glad to help you. I have all the help I need, thanks. See you later, Derby. Come along, King. Oh, oh. John Derby saw Sergeant Preston speak to the bartender. The white apron man led the Mountie and King to Pete Burwell's office at the far end of the cafe. The man and dog entered the office and the door closed behind them. A short time later, the bartender returned to the cafe and resumed his duties. Still sitting at his table, John Derby supposed that Preston was in the office waiting for Pete Burwell. He didn't know that Sergeant Preston had secured a coat belonging to the cafe owner. From the coat, King got Burwell sent. And then the dog and his master left the office by means of a door that led directly to the outside. The great dog King picked up Pete Burwell's set outside the cafe. He had no difficulty following it. Heading for the hills, eh, King? Keep going, boy. I'm with you. Soon, the town of Big Elk lay behind the Mountie and his dog. Darkness fell, but King continued without slowing his pace. And then the moon rose, flooding the hills with light. Preston could see the tracks of the man he was following and knew he was within shouting distance of Pete Burwell. Good work, King. There's our man ahead. Hello there. Hello. I want to talk to you. Sure thing. You Pete Burwell? That's right. Who are you? Sergeant Preston, Northwest Mounted Police. Policeman, huh? Well, Sergeant Preston, you're the man I want to see. Really? I'm heading for a cabin about two miles north. A friend of mine went there this morning. I haven't heard from him since. I'm afraid he may be in trouble. Is your friend Sam Baker? You know him? I understand Baker's been murdered. What? Murdered? An eyewitness claims you shot him. That isn't true. I've never killed anyone. Very well, I'll have to take your gun. All right, Sergeant. Here. Gripping the barrel of his revolver, Pete handed the gun to Sergeant Preston. The Mountie stuck the weapon in his belt. Now I suppose the next thing is handcuffs. As long as you're disarmed, that won't be necessary. Standing beside his master, King knew that Pete was still a menace. Though Preston didn't know it, Pete Burwell had another gun. A sneak gun that was small and deadly. We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. Listen, all you fellas, girls, mothers, dads, everybody. There's something special for each one of you inside your package of Quaker Oats or Mother's Oats right now. It's a folder that offers you nationally known merchandise at savings up to 40% or more. Just use the little blue stars from Quaker cereal packages. They count like money towards such items for you fellas and girls as a Wilson Fielder's mitt, complete camera outfit, beautiful Love Me Baby doll, roller skates, tricycle. One of the items for you dads is a Remington Deluxe Shaver, regular $29.50 value, with 10 blue stars, only $18.83, a saving of over $10. And you ladies can save $40 on a 17-jewel Benrus watch. Just buy Quaker Oats or Mother's Oats, either quick or old-fashioned, round or square package. The folder inside gives you full details. Hurry, save up to 40% or more on valuable and useful merchandise. Get Quaker Oats or Mother's Oats today. Now to continue. Sergeant Preston and the great dog King had overtaken the man they sought. Pete Burwell had surrendered his revolver to the mountain. Sergeant Preston, who told you Sam had been murdered? John Derby reported it. Derby? Yes, he said you and Sam Baker were seen this afternoon by a man named Blaze. Blaze saw you shoot Baker. That's a lie. What's your story? I was east of here today with John Derby looking at some property. Oh? Anyone else with you? No. I don't know why John told you I killed Sam Baker. Sam and I are friends. Sam came to Elk City three weeks ago determined to catch two crooks who robbed him. What made him think he could catch them? They slugged him and thought they knocked him out. He was stunned, but conscious enough to hear their conversation. I see. Learned that they have a shack somewhere outside of Elk City. Sam's looked for the place for the last three weeks. Yesterday, he took binoculars with him. That's how he spotted smoke coming from the chimney of an old trapper's cabin that supposedly deserted. Did he investigate? No, he figured it'd take him an hour to reach the place, so rather than risk getting lost in the hills at night, he came back to town. He told me about the cabin, and as far as I know, he went there today. He didn't come back. Do you know where to find the cabin? Yes, I was going there when you stopped me. I thought Sam might be in trouble. We'll go there together. I hoped you'd say that, Sergeant Preston. Uh, what about my gun? I'll keep it. 
You've been accused of murder, Burwell. For the time being, you're under arrest. All right, Sergeant. Lead the way. In his anxiety to reach the cabin as soon as possible, Pete Burwell set a fast pace for himself. Sergeant Preston and King followed closely, and Pete knew that both man and dog watched his every move. Meanwhile, Blaze had reached the cabin. He gave his partner a detailed account of his talk with John Derby. Yeah, with a Monty and Big Elk, it seems to me the smart thing for us to do would be to clear out. Well, I thought of that, Cork. We'll not collect our share of the cash until Derby sells the furs. We run out now, we've worked for nothing and killed a man in a bargain. I'm staying to collect. Yeah, I'll get some grub ready. We'll eat now, then go out and wait for the trapper. Bring in some wood for the fire while I start things going. Why don't you bring it in? Been here all day doing nothing while I hike the big elk. All right, all right, I'll get the wood. Dip the kettle over a barrel and put it on the stove. The firewood was stacked in front of the cabin, and as Cork gathered up an armful, he glanced at the moonlit valley. Looks like someone heading this way. For a moment, he stood motionless, watching the valley. The figures of two men and a dog emerged from the shadow of giant trees. There was no mistake in their destination. They're coming here. Please. Huh? Look out the window. Throw off plenty. Two men and a dog are heading this way. Maybe they're just looking for shelter for the night. And maybe they're looking for stolen furs like Baker was. Now listen, Blaze. I'm going up in the loft. I'll be able to cover him without being seen. You open the door and let him in. Right. If they've come here to snoop, they're in for a surprise. Within a few minutes, there was a knock at the door. Oh, howdy. Mind if we come in? Not at all. Step inside. Baker's body was still in the cellar of the cabin. The great dog king was quick to sense the presence of death. His every instinct cried danger. This is Pete Burwell. I'm Sergeant Preston, Northwest Mounted Police. Police? Huh? We're looking for a man named Sam Baker. Up your hands! What? You heard what my partner said. He's up in the loft with his gun ready. Tell your dog to quiet down or I'll put my first bullet right between your eyes. Quiet, King. Quiet, boy. Sergeant Preston. If Sam came here and ran into these... Sam two... Baker came here, all right. He's still here. And he's alive. You're wrong, Burwell. He's dead. You killed him. Yeah, we killed him. All right, take your guns, Blaze. I'll cover you. Don't either one of you get any ideas of making a fast move or grabbing Blaze and using him as a shield. Where I am, I can get your bones without hitting my butt. Preston realized the futility of refusing to surrender his gun. He also knew King would be shot if he made a move to attack the killers. With his hands at shoulder level, the sergeant made no protest as Blaze disarmed him. Hey, there's a gun from your holster and the one you were carrying in your belt. That one belongs to me. The sergeant disarmed me on the trail. Shut up. So this time, Cork, come on down from the loft. I'll wait till you tie the hands. Make sure you tie them good and fight. With the hands of the two men tightly bound, Cork descended the ladder while his partner held a gun. Captain, I'll kill that dog if he doesn't shut up. Quiet, King. What'll we do with these two, Cork? Take them to the cellar. Then we'll tie their feet and leave them there. You go to town and report to the boss. You gonna stand guard? I have to go out on the trail and wait for Joe Morris. Somebody might come here and find these two while we're gone. There's not a chance in a thousand that anyone will come here. But if they do, the two of us will shove the water barrel over the trap door. Without help, it'll be too heavy for anyone to move aside. What about the dog? We turn him loose? No. We might go back to town for help. We'll chain him in the cellar where he can't do any damage. Though the Mountie knew King was waiting for the command to attack, Preston remained silent. He knew that the odds were too great for the faithful dog. Without help, King could not disarm two killers. And with his hands tied, Preston was powerless to help. In the cellar, King was securely chained to a heavy upright log that supported the ceiling. Then while he snarled low-voiced protests, Preston's feet were tied. Pete Burwell was also tied. And then Cork and Blaze mounted the narrow wooden stairs and slammed the trap door closed. 
prisoners heard the water barrel being moved into place. Inch by inch, it scraped across the floor. Listening to the sound, Preston knew that it took all the strength of the two men to move the water-filled barrel. The great dog, King, struggled frantically to free himself of the chain, but it was hopeless. Easy, King. Easy, boy. King was as much a prisoner as his master, and equally helpless. Presently, the door of the cabin opened and slammed as Blaze and Cork went their separate ways. We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. Watch the premiere of Sergeant Preston of the Yukon on television tonight. This is the big night, the premiere of the adventure series you've loved on radio. Starring Sergeant Preston, his big black horse Rex, and his wonder dog, Yukon King. They're brand new stories packed with adventure, mystery, romance, bravery. Now you can actually see Sergeant Preston fighting hand-to-hand with desperados of the Yukon. Actually see his dog, King, leap at gold-hungry killers. You'll see magnificent Yukon scenery unfold before your eyes. Rushing rapids, and later, terrifying avalanches and snowslides. It's something new and different in television. Brought to you on a coast-to-coast network by all the Quaker cereals. Quaker Pup Wheat and Rice, Quaker Oats, Mother's Oats, Muppet Shredded Wheat, and Quaker Paco 10. Remember, it's tonight, Thursday, and every Thursday. The exciting premiere of Sergeant Preston of the Yukon on television. Check your newspaper for the time and the station nearest you. Now to continue. The cellar was dark, but Sergeant Preston remembered seeing a bottle on the floor nearby. The bottle had held a candle that had apparently been forgotten by the man who had left it there. The Mountie squirmed along the floor, with his bound wrist reaching forward. It was only minutes before he found the bottle. Gripping the neck firmly, he raised his hands and smashed the bottle against the floor. <laughs> Holding a piece of glass, Preston moved to Pete Burwell's side. Hold still, Pete. All right. Awkwardly, he began to saw the rope that bound Pete's wrist. It was slow, tedious work, but at length, the sharp edge of the glass cut through the rope and Pete's hands were free. <laughs> Now, Sergeant, I'll use the glass to cut your wrists free. Smashing that bottle was a mighty smart idea. Good thing you thought of it. There. Thanks, please. Go to work on those ropes. Easy, King. As soon as I'm free, I'll take that chain off your collar, boy. As soon as the rope around his wrist had been cut away, Preston found another piece of glass. Both he and Pete Burwell worked on the rope around their ankles. Soon they were both on their feet, and the great dog King was free. <laughs> Preston struck a match to the candle and placed the light on the floor. Now to get out of here. We have a big job ahead of us, Pete. That water barrel's on top of the trap door. If we both stand on the stairs and put our shoulders to the trap door, we may be able to open it. Uh, we'll try. Come on. These stairs are plenty narrow. Flimsy, too. I hope they'll support our weight. Let's give it a try. Ready, Sergeant? Yes. Uh, both men placed their shoulders against the trap door and pushed. The door remained closed, and the stairs creaked dangerously beneath their weight. Both together now, Pete. Right. While the trap door resisted their best efforts to open it, the stairs collapsed. Sergeant Preston, you're right. Yes, Pete. How about you? Uh, I'm not hurt. Look at the stairs. Just a mass of kindling wood now. Uh, now we'll never get out of here. With the stairs gone, we're really trapped. Too bad we have no guns. Oh. Uh, a gun wouldn't get us out of here. It would be a help. We could put a couple of bullets through the water barrel, the water drain out. And by standing on your shoulders, I could open the door and haul you and King out of here. <laughs> I never thought of that. Wishful thinking, Pete, that's all. Not so wishful, Sergeant Preston. What do you mean? When I started out tonight to look for Sam, I prepared for trouble. I generally keep this little derringer in the cash register at the casino. Tonight, I put it up my sleeve. <laughs> you see, you you didn't entirely disarm me, Sergeant. See, this is the first time I've ever been glad to see a snake gun. Let's have it. Here you are. Right. You did it. That bullet went right through the trap door. I had punctured the water barrel. Well, wait until the barrel's light enough to move, and then we'll get out of here. 
Later, Cork returned to the cabin, driving a sled loaded with Joe Morris's pelts. Well pleased with his night's nice work, he opened the door and entered the cabin. Hey. Come in, Cork, and close the door. Hi. How'd you get free? Well, explain that when your partner and the boss arrive. Take his gun, please. Right. We'll tie and gag him and wait for the other two. It was nearly daybreak when Blaze reached the cabin. He was accompanied by John Derby, the boss who had directed the activities of the fur thieves. As they approached the door, King sounded a low warning. Quiet, King. What do you want me to do, please? We'll have to shoot them out of your throat. Please, both of you. Sergeant Preston and Pete Burwell held guns on Blaze and his boss. Don't shoot, sir. Blaze threw up his hands and surrendered. And in the split second that followed, John Derby weighed his chances of escape. Realizing that his freedom and perhaps his life was at stake, he turned to run through the open door. Get him, King. <laughs> While Pete covered Blaze, King leaped at John Derby. The weight of the dog's charge threw Derby to the floor, where he lay frantically clawing at his holster. If your gun clears leather, I'll break your arm. All right, all right. You've been charged with your dog. Please don't take your gun. Steady, King. Watch him, boy. On your feet, Derby. Yes. Please, you dirty double crosser. You told me Preston and Burwell were prisoners. We were. Now you two, as well as your partner Cork, are prisoners. All three of you are under arrest for robbery and murder. Oh, no. I, I didn't kill anyone. Please kill Sam Baker. Yes, but you knew all about it, John. If you hadn't, you wouldn't have tried to frame me for the murder. Sergeant Preston, while you're covering these crooks, I'll put Sam Baker's body on a sled, and we'll take it back to town. Good idea, Pete. Sergeant Preston, listen to me. I have money. I'll make a deal with you. All the furs in the cellar. All the furs in the cellar are going to the trappers to whom they belong, and you're going to jail. This case is closed. These Sergeant Preston of the Yukon Adventures are brought to you every Monday through Friday at this time by the Quaker Oats Company. Makers of Quaker Pop Wheat and Quaker Pop Rice, the delicious cereals shot from guns. By special recording in cooperation with the Mutual Broadcasting System. They are a copyrighted feature of Sergeant Preston of the Yukon Incorporated. Created by George W. Trendle... Produced by Trendle Campbell Muir Incorporated and directed by Fred Flowerday. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Pop Wheat and Quaker Pop Rice. So long.